everyone for, for joining us today. Um, as mentioned, my name is Sandy Snellgrove, and I'm the branch chief, a branch chief in DHS Behavioral Health, and our team oversees opioid settlement funds. Um, we want to thank all of you for your um, partnership and uh, joining us today as we implement something as significant as uh, use and expenditure and re reporting requirements from opioid settlements and opioid bankruptcies. Next slide, please. Um, a little background on the status of the Mallinckrodt bankruptcy <clears throat> is that an initial bankruptcy with Mallinckrodt Pharmaceuticals was reached in February of 2022. Um, they selected a trustee, um, and so those funds are managed by the National Opioid Abatement Trust II, referenced as NOAT II. If you're receiving payment um, for both settlements and um, bankruptcy payments, there's a difference. You'll you'll notice that those payments um, will say that they were wired or the check was received from NOAD. Um, due to some ongoing solvency, we should say, issues on August 28, 2023, Mallinckrodt Pharmaceuticals also announced a second bankruptcy filing. Um, which was approved on uh, October 10th, 2023. <clears throat> Before the second filing, oops. <clears throat> Before the second filing, um, negotiations were made between Mallinckrodt Pharmaceuticals and the NOAT uh, trustees for uh, $250, uh, excuse me, wow, $250 million payment to be made. Um, on behalf of, of the bankruptcy settlement, and they will um, move forward with a second bankruptcy filing. At this time, we think we're unaware, unaware is if any additional payments will come from, from NOAT. Um, and as um, uh, all of the, the settlements and bankruptcies allocations for California are specific to be over 9% uh, of those funds will be distributed to California from the trust. Um, so a little bit complicated for the Mallinckrodt bank, um, the bankruptcy because again, um, there was an initial filing, initial set of payments went out to local governments, which is cities and counties here in California due to ongoing sol solvency issues with Mallinckrodt. Um, they negotiated a $250 million payment um, and uh, will be filing a second bankruptcy. Uh, payment status and how that second bankruptcy will look is still unknown at this time. Next slide, please. The reason that we have additional reporting requirement, um, which is the reporting form that we're launching today, is because the structure of this bankruptcy is is different than that of the settlements. And so the division of the funds within California are governed by the California Statewide Abatement Agreement. Local governments, um, which are allocated to all participating cities and counties, um, will receive 60% of those funds and the state share will be 40%. That 40% is allocated to the state of California for a state directed opioid remediation projects. As of March 2023, local governments, um, based on information that we've received, payment details from NOAA um, is a little over $9 million that has been distributed to those um, cities that have received direct, cities and counties receiving direct payment, and over $6 million to the state of California. Next slide, please. A list of all of the uh, bankruptcy payments received by cities and counties is available on the DHCS website. The list is updated as of April 2023, and in my previous slides, I mentioned that Mallinckrodt made an additional $250 million payment uh, to NOAA um, prior to announcing their second bankruptcy filing, um, and at this moment, we don't have any updated um, payment details, um, but as soon as we have those, those will be posted on the DHCS California Opioid Settlement Fund website. Allocation for participating cities are automatically reallocated um, to their respective counties unless the city opts into direct payment from the distributor settlement. So this is a little bit complicated in the sense that um, if you, the way they structured the bankruptcy agreements is if a city opted in, uh, not opted in to participate, but opted in to direct payment from the distributor's settlement, 
they were automatically opted in to receiving direct payment from the Mountain Crop Bankruptcy. Um, information about payments made to California can be found on the National Opioid Abatement Trustee website. Um, on that website, it includes all of the Mountain Crop documents, the bankruptcy documents, the state abatement agreements, um, as well as payment um, disbursements. And so their website is also um, additional resources where updated information can be obtained. If, if you have questions about your allocation, you would need to contact NOAC too. And we've included their email address here. And again, these slides will be provided um, to everyone um, immediately following the um, webinar today. Next slide, please. Like the settlements, DHCS is tasked um, with collecting annual expenditure reports from cities and counties receiving funds from NOAT2. We will use these reports to complete a state, um, the state's beneficiary abatement use report to the NOAT trustees. Um, DHCS does not distribute payments. This is very similar to the settlements as the um, payments do not pass through the state of California or the Department of Healthcare Services. Those payments come directly from, um, from NOAC. Next slide, please. I'm going to briefly go over expenditure reporting requirements. Um, like the settlement agreements, although they're structured differently, there's the same focus. <clears throat> the Mountain Crop Bankruptcy follows the same definite definition. Um, as the settlement agreements around opioid remediation, um, which is defined as care treatment and other programs and expenditures designed to address the misuse and abuse of opioid products, treat or mitigate opioid use related disorders, and mitigate other alleged effects um, of including on those injured as a result of the opioid epidemic. So although a lot of differences um, structure-wise, mostly around allocation, there's um, uh, a lot of similar similarities between the statewide abatement agreement agreements for this bankruptcy, as well as the settlement agreement. Funds must be used for future opioid remediation in one or more of the opioid remediation activities listed in Exhibit 4 of the Mallet-Crot Bankruptcy Plan. This is Exhibit E of the National Opioid Settlement Agreement, so it's the same. Um, exhibit 4, just like Exhibit E from the National Settlements, is broken into core uh, strategies, which is Schedule A of Exhibit E and a longer list of approved uses, which are found in Schedule B of Exhibit E. Um, Schedule A is a much shorter list. It identifies core strategies that were identified um, during the, the um, national um, litigation and, and settlement agreements. Um, they're listed as core strategies that um, should be prioritized because of their known effectiveness to abate the opioid crisis. Different from <clears throat> settlements is that no less than 95% of mal crop funds received by a local government must be used on Schedule B approved uses. Next slide, please. Sorry, you might be beating me. Um, there are some differences in expenditure requirements, um, opioid settlements. The funds must be used for future opioid remediation in one or more areas listed in Exhibit E, um, whereas the funds must be used for future opioid remediation through one or more of the strategies listed in Exhibit 4 of the Mountain Crop Bankruptcy Plan. Um, just to, again, Exhibit E, they're, they're both Exhibit E. Um, for opioid settlements, um, no less than 50% of those funds received from the California Abatement Accounts Fund in each calendar year must be used for one of the California High Impact Abatement Activities, and there's no requirement for that 50% High Impact Abatement Activity expenditure requirement in the Mallinckrodt uh, Bankruptcy Plan. Um, administrative costs in the opioid settlements um, should not exceed actual costs or 10% of the total allocation, um, whereas the Mallinckrodt Bankruptcy is very specific that 95% uh, of funds received must go directly back into opioid remediation. 
um, whereas 5% of the uh, total allocation um, can be used for administer administrative costs to administer and disperse these funds. Next slide, please. I'm gonna jump into the expenditure reporting form. Next slide. This is a comparison between the expenditure reporting between opioid settlements and Mallinckrodt bankruptcy. Um, for both of these um, uh, bankruptcy funds, as well as opioid settlement funds, cities and counties, uh, the primary um, department or um, lead uh, agency within each um, city and county shall only submit one expenditure report an annually to DHCS. With that information, DHCS will prepare an annual written report regarding the use of those funds. And for the bankruptcy, in addition to that, DHCS will compile local reports from cities and counties to complete the state's beneficiary abatement use report to NOAC II. Um, the, the expenditures or the reports for opioid settlements will continue until funds are fully expended and for one year thereafter. That's the same for the Mallinckrodt bankruptcy. Um, and these reports will be made publicly and available on the DHCS website. Submission requirements, uh, again, going back to what I just mentioned is local governments um, ha should have identified who the lead agency or department within the local government that will, that will be responsible for the oversight and, and distribution of both settlement and um, Mallinckrodt bankruptcy funds. So local governments, whoever that might be, shall only submit one expenditure report to DHCS annually for funds received from the settlements and bankruptcies. Um, if the local governments, uh, it's the local government's responsibility to collect all required information. So the local government, um, after distribution of funds um, through contracts or agreements um, to um, implement opioid remediation activities at the local levels. It's, it's the primary local government's responsibility to collect all of that information from sub-grantees or contractors and to compile that and submit in one singular report. Very important that um, after this webinar, we'll be sending the link to this report so that it can be accessed and local governments can begin to submit their reports. Um, it's important that you do not send that expenditure reporting form to contractors or subgrantees um, who you may have awarded your settlement uh, funds to. And also, it's important to note that only one um, form can be completed and can be completed by one person. Um, a PDF version of the form and a necessary materials checklist will be provided. Um, to your local government so that you can see what's going to be required in the report, as well as what necessary materials you may have uh, that you may need before you enter the online form. And please note that the, the PDF version of that form is not to be used for submission. The form, um, the report must be submitted and completed online. Also one note here, and I apologize, the form um, does not have to be completed at once. So you may return to that form and the information should be saved um, as long as the same browser is used and if cookies and history have not been deleted from the browser. We would encourage local governments to have the data saved elsewhere prior to entering it into the online form in case there's any technical glitches in saving the data that you've already submitted in the online form. Next slide, please. The form structure is really broken out into five main components um, in, the, in the expenditure form is what I'm referencing. Um, and so that structure really is broken into the section of the payments that you've received from NOAT to any reallocations that have been made either to another local government, participating local government, or any that you've received from another local government. And then 
expenditures, which would include um, approved use categories, administrative expenses, and then it moves on to the last, last section, would be, which would be attestations. And we'll go over that um, here in the next few slides. In addition to um, uh, this presentation, there are additional support documents, like I mentioned, uh, that will be made available. Um, and Chelsea or someone from Herrera, I just want to confirm, we're going to be making these available on the DHCS website, or will they be included in the email, linked in the email after the webinar when we send the link to the online form? Both, Sandy. They will be posted on the website and they will be linked in the email. Perfect. Thank you. Um, again, the support documents that will be included, and these will always be available on the DHCS Opioid Settlement Fund webpage, would be the necessary materials checklist. Again, this is a document to support you in making sure prior to entering the online form that you have all of the necessary materials. In addition, there's a question and answer document. This is frequently asked questions that we've already received. Um, and again, um, this will be included and posted. And then I would say within a week or so, any questions um, and responses um, from today's webinar will also be included. Um, and I would just ask that you, we have a little bit of time to get that updated, but um, just check back frequently to the DHCS webpage. In addition, we'll include the Mallinckrodt expenditure reporting form. Basically, this is the online form, um, but it's in a PDF um, preview version, which will allow you to be able to see exactly all of the sections that you'll be reporting on so that you're prepared prior to entering the online form. Um, in addition, um, we've linked here the list of opioid remediation use uses, which is Exhibit E and Exhibit 4, and then also California's Mallinckrodt Statewide Allocation Agreement. Next slide. We're going to uh, begin covering the online expenditure report, a reporting form. Um, just note that some of these screenshots are just um, minor, like not the entire section of a screenshot um, in some of the areas, but you'll be able to see all of that when you look at the PDF version of this online form. Uh, section one, it collects basic information about your local government and the individual completing the online form. The next section will go into payments and expenditures. This is section two. <clears throat> it'll, it'll cover reporting the total payments that you've received from NOAC to um, in the fiscal year in which we're reporting. So um, this, this report that we're launching today um, is for any payments that you've received from MOAC to um, very, very similar to settlements um, that you've received in fiscal year 22-23. Um, and so you'll list the total amount of funds that you've received, and you'll list the total interest you've earned from any of those bankruptcy funds that you received from NOAT. Slide, please. Section two will also ask about reallocations. Um, and this is the reallocations that maybe you have received from another local government, as well as any reallocations that you've made to another local government. Um, and again, these would be reallocations that happen within the fiscal year in which we're reporting, which in this instance is 2020, 22-23. Um, and then um, it's important to note on this, actually, that's probably my next slide. I just noticed, next slide. Uh, a note on reallocation. Uh, this section is intended to capture transfers between local governments that happened after the NOAT 2 funds were dispersed and received by your local government. Um, this would not include funds um, uh, that were redirected automatically because the city opted out of direct payment. And that would be opting out of direct payment before the NOAT 2 disbursement date. Um, so in that indication, in that instance, if a city has opted out of receiving direct payment, 
prior to the disbursement of those funds from NOAT, that that money automatically goes directly to the county in which that city is located. And that city, if you opted out of direct payment completely, would not be required to report. If, if you've received the funds and choose to reallocate them to another local government, after you would be still you would still be required to report on the funds that you've received and the funds that you've reallocated so just again if your city opted out of receiving funds you're not required to report if you did not receive those funds Section three um, says where we begin the expenditure section. Um, and this question or these questions will ask if your if your local government has expended any of the funds received during that reporting year. So this is again any expenditures of those funds that you've had um, in 22-23. And if the answer is no, so if you say yes, we've received these funds, but when you get to this section and um, you have not expended any of those funds, the online form will automatically skip to the end of the expenditure section. If you answer yes, um, there are additional expenditure questions that you would need to answer. Next slide. <clears throat> this provides a screenshot um, of that next section if you were to answer yes that you've expended some funds. Um, and you would be asked to categorize funds by Exhibit E, Exhibit 4 categories. And these are the major categories. Um, so for example, um, you would select um, from the main uh, categories like treatment for opioid use disorders or something else. And then you would report on the next section. I'll go ahead and advance that slide. Um, you would then identify any sub-strategy for each selected category that, from Exhibit E. Um, only one sub-strategy may be selected for each category, so please select the sub-strategy that really best corresponds to the project or activity. Um, again, this is only a partial screenshot. Um, and so if you um, uh, select multiple strategies, uh, um, categories, and um, uh, then this will really kind of come down each time for you to report on the sub-strategy from each of those categories. Hopefully that, that makes sense, but we can provide any assistance um, by reaching out to us to really clarify that. Next slide, please. Um, I think we passed um, a couple slides. We're on administrative expenses. Perfect. Thank you. Um, section four collects information on administ administrative expenses. Um, and um, it would really just be a report on if they exceeded that 5% or not. Um, again, this would be administrative expenses um, that were incurred in, in the 22-23 fiscal year. Um, any administrative expenses which are considered indirect cost, meaning not um, expenses related to the direct administration of opioid remediation activities, um, must be reasonable and may not exceed 5% of the total bankruptcy payment. Next slide, please. Section five um, is um, an opportunity for local governments to uh, um, request technical assistance from DHCS. Um, this question will, will ask you if you want some technical assistance, you can answer yes or no. Um, there's also um, some links here in the slide um, that go to the DHCS Opioid Settlement Fund website so you can look at that technical assistance process. <clears throat> and um, what would be needed um, for you to submit a technical assistance request. Next slide, please. Uh, this is the last section, which is the attestations. 
um, the, the form must be certified um, and also certified that the, the funds were used in accordance with the agreements. Um, and the form will also allow for a signature to be added. So when you get to this section, um, you would just be attesting they're used in compliance with the agreements and then um, uh, certifying that everything on the report is true and correct. Next slide, please. Um, I think we're at questions. Yes, I wanted to just um, put up the um, next step slide here, Sandy, um, and it actually needs some correcting. Um, we have the online form that will be going out to all local governments um, later today. Um, so just to recap, the, the uh, form and all of the supporting documents referenced today will be sent out to all of the contacts um, later today, as well as um, this webinar and materials will be posted on the DHCS website. Um, and before we jump into questions, Sandy, did you want to touch on the um, the reporting deadlines? Yes, not a problem. So reports are due on November 30th, um, but since DHCS um, is just now getting to launching um, this online form for local government, there's an automatic extension that's being granted to December 31st. We would, however, encourage you if you've received funds and have not expended, um, the form will be particularly quite easy to, to complete. Um, so I um, would encourage you not to, to wait beyond um, that, um, that time frame, but we will be extending until December 31st. Um, uh, I want to, to note that we are um, attempting to align reporting efforts between this bankruptcy and any future bankruptcies um, align with the reporting requirements for settlements. And so each year the reporting um, uh, period will open up the new online form which should be available um, somewhere around July 1st, but reports would be due to DHCS by September 30th of each year ongoing. Great, thank you, Sandy. I think we can go back to the questions slide now. Um, so we do have some questions that have come into the chat um, since the beginning of the presentation. So of course, um, folks are asking when will the form be available and the due dates. I think we just covered those that the form will be available later today and that the uh, reporting form will be due um, technically at the end of November and then uh, a grace period through the end of the year for this year's reporting. Um, another question that we received was um, just confirmation from someone that 95% of Mallinckrodt funds can be uh, spent on Schedule B activities and 5% can be spent on administrative costs. Yes, that's in the statewide abatement agreement, and that can be found on our, our, our website as well. Um, another person notes that the person doing the data entry in the, the form is uh, not the person who should attest that funds were used appropriately and um, it'd be the one to attest to that. Um, they were wondering if there was a different way to attest or um, if, if Sandy, you could speak to who should complete the form in that case. Um, yeah, I think it would be handled um, the way that we've handled settlements, as well as the person completing the form would be attesting that um, the information that they're reporting on is true and correct. This is why we're encouraging the um, uh, use of, of some of our support documents to prepare prior to going into the online form. Um, and we can clarify that if it already isn't clarified in our FAQs. Great. Another person asks if this form will continue to be required on an annual basis until the funds are spent in total. Yes. So the requirement for annual reporting to DHCS is required until all funds from a local government are expended and one year thereafter. Great. Thank you. Yeah, and I want to add to that too, Chelsea, I apologize for interrupting. I want to add to that too, is that um, as you can imagine, 
um, navigating um, lifting up something this significant across the state. Um, DHCS is fully aware that there will, will likely be adjustments to these online reporting forms over the next couple of years until we get them refined. And and um, so I just wanted to kind of state that. But yes, there, there there is annual reporting requirements until those funds are fully funded. Yeah. A person asks, if a local government made no expenditures during the fiscal year, does it still need to submit a report? Yes. If you received funds um, from NOAT2, um, you would need to report um, the funds that you received within that 22-23 uh, fiscal year or each fiscal year for each annual report moving forward. Um, and then just put zero for those expenditures. Another person is asking about um, length of expenditure authority for these funds. Uh, they're asking how long do we have to spend each year's allocation? Sorry, having some technical difficulties here. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Um, I'm Right at this moment, we're not saying anything in statewide abatement agreements around expenditure authority, but we'll address that in our FAQs. Um, another person asked um, if they haven't spent any of the funds yet, are they being required to report on how they might spend them in the next year? So um, I think referencing the opioid settlements reporting form, there is a planned expenditure portion and the, uh, this um, uh, participant is asking if uh, the same thing is included in the Mallinckrodt reporting. Um, no, currently in the Mallinckrodt reporting, and correct me if I'm wrong, Chelsea, we're not asking for any um, planned expenditures. Right, that is not included in the form uh, for Mallinckrodt. Um, another person asks about the reporting deadlines in the coming years. So um, they are requesting confirmation about whether the report is due next year um, at the end of September, so on September 30th. Yes, and that'll be included in our guidance as well on frequently asked questions or any policy guidance that DHCS publishes. Um, another yeah. person, oh, sorry, go ahead. I was going to say an apologies if I didn't answer that question. We would um, be requiring the reporting to be on the same cycle as the settlements, which would be due September 30th. Thank you. Um, another person asks, are agencies that are opted into distributor settlements the same as opt-ins for the bankruptcy? If a local government opted out of direct funds for the distributor settlement, is it correct that they do not need to report for this bankruptcy? You would need to report um, for this bankruptcy if you received payment. And you, you can always check on your opt-in and opt-out status um, because it's also opting into the bankruptcy um, and settlements, but it's also opting out of direct payment. Um, and you can um, contact your city, county, or outside council that handled your opioid-related matters to find out your, your status. But if you receive payment from NOAT um, for Mallinckrodt funds, you would be required to report. Thank you, Sandy. And just a reminder, I believe the DHCS website also has a list of all cities and counties that have received funds from NOAT2 as of April 2023. So um, that, that is another resource that's available. Another question is, um, will DHCS provide input on the recent settlement expenditure reports that were submitted? This participant notes that they would appreciate guidance on planned expenditures if there are any concerns. So um, Sandy, do you wanna speak a little bit to TA that's available from the department? 
Yeah, and I think we have um, uh, outlined a pretty good technical assistance process on the DHCS Opioid Settlement Fund webpage, um, where we just ask that you review um, the, the respective settlement agreements, which would include any mal and fraud abatement agreement um, prior to submitting a technical assistance form. But there's a completion of a form um, that sort of asks for you to specify not specifically, but what you're thinking around your expenditures, unless you have specific information, we'll take that as well. Um, and then DHCS will provide a written response or request to, uh, to meet for a technical assistance meeting. Great. Um, another person is asking about the due date of October 31st, which is for the settlements. Um, so wondering, Sandy, if you might want to provide a little guidance around how this differs and how their reporting timelines differ for this as well. Um, yeah, I think the reporting differences are just because it's this year. Um, September 30th is is ongoing, the, the date that we'll be requesting. Is it September or October, Chelsea? I apologize. I believe uh, in future years, it'll be at the end of September, but um, the reporting yeah. timeframes are a little shifted this year for just the, the start of this reporting cycle. Yeah, thank you so much. I didn't want to misspeak, but yes, in future years, it would be September 30th, um, but we launched the opioid settlement uh, reporting online form in August, and so that due date for reporting is October 31st, but because we're just now launching the re online reporting form for Mallon Crop Bankruptcy, we're extending it to December 31st. Hopefully that clarified. I think we're coming to the end of questions. I'm just doing a quick review to make sure we don't have any others. Um, but one person does ask about the um, the lengths of time for expenditure. And I believe you already answered that, Sandy, that those um, five and seven year periods that are outlined in the opioid settlement agreements um, aren't included in the bankruptcy um, state agreement. Yes, and we can include information on expenditure periods or the lack thereof in the FAQ. Great, thank you. And another person asks um, if they didn't select requesting technical assistance in the form, can they change their mind later and submit a form separately requesting technical assistance? Of, of course, I mean, you can submit a technical assistance uh, question to DHCS at any time. I believe that is all we have for questions. Um, so I will turn it back to Sandy to um, wrap us up with next steps. And um, as we mentioned earlier, questions that were discussed today will be added to future frequently asked questions resources as well. Yeah, and thanks Chelsea, I really appreciate the support. Next slide, please. Um, DHCS has provided a lot of past webinars and listening sessions. Um, which includes a lot of resources in um, opioid settlement reporting requirements, allowable expenses, and really around considerations for allocating settlement funds. And one on June 21st, where we um, had partners join us from local opioid coalitions, um, and that uh, a lot of resources were provided in that um, webinar as well. Um, on August 1st, in addition, we also hosted the webinar around the Opioid Settlement Agreement Expenditure Reporting Form. All of these uh, PowerPoint presentations, as well as the recording from these um, webinars and listening sessions, are available on the DHCS Opioid Settlement Fund webpage. Next slide, please. Um, we have a link here for you to, to access the webpage as well as any questions or any feedback on today's presentation or for anything else for that matter. Um, there's the, um, you can reach DHCS team at osf at dhcs.ca.gov. And we've also provided a link to complete the 
FDA request form. Once you've completed that technical assistance request form, you would just email it to the OSF at DHCS inbox. And again, um, links to information um, from us. And we want to thank everybody for joining us today and participating. We look forward to um, receiving your reports and any technical assistance requests. We uh, want to partner with cities and counties and all of our local governments to um, really adequately and ensure the use of funds are effective in abating the opioid crisis. So thank you once again for your time today. And thank you for joining us. And we'll talk soon.